Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz, with me today. Very special guest, former WWE superstar, OVW superstar. He is known as Tank, Mr. John the Tank Tolan. Welcome to the two-man power trip. How are you doing? Hey, thanks for having me, John. It's great to be here. What's going on in your world? Oh, man. What's what's not going on when you got a three-and-a-half-year-old? Um, <laughs> just uh, having a great time being a dad, uh, staying in shape. You know, just trying to, so I can keep up with her and, uh, you know, and bump around in the ring still and have a good time and just, uh, try and live, live a happy, healthy life. That's pretty much what I've been up to. Yeah. Anything wrestling related? Uh, you know, I actually, I have, um, I do have some things coming up. I'm, I'm actually getting, knocking some of the ring rust off really. Um, not like there's a lot to knock off, but you know, just, uh, you know, when you haven't been in there for a little bit of time, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to go in there and, and give it your give it your best performance. Because, you know, I the last thing I want to do is go in the ring and uh, like some of these guys I've seen that, you know, has stepped away for a little while and they come back and it's just and it's like you should never have come back, you know. So I don't want to be one of those guys. So, yeah. But uh, but I love it, man. I love it. And it's just I had to at first I had to take off some time uh, just for some like health reasons and like injury stuff. But and uh, but now that, you know, I'm able to go full steam again, I'm, I'm so ready to get back in there. Is that one of those things where you like look at it and you're dying to get back in the ring or you're OK with kind of not working as much? I mean, I guess for everybody, it's it's their own personal feelings. I mean, for me. Uh, growing up being such a huge fan, as most people that get into, you know, the business, they all have the story of like, you know, being a, a lifelong fan and all that stuff. And they have their story of what really inspired them to get into it. Um, but it, it was always a passion of mine uh, from the time I was a little kid, being a little runt, being picked on and, and bullied and stuff like that. And and then and turning on the TV and seeing guys like, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan uh, and, you know, the Macho Man and all these guys that were so big and, and, and just impressive uh, and just whooping up. And uh, I was like, shoot, I want to be like that. I don't want to get picked on and beat up. So, uh, you know, that's kind of one of the things that inspired me. And the fact that they're just like so over the top with their personalities. And I was always a fun time as a little kid, just like a little showman, uh, you know, uh, just having fun being theatrical and ridiculous and, and uh, trying to always grab the spotlight. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was always a big thing for me. And, you know, you would think that maybe – Maybe as you get older and you you go through it long enough, you kind of get over you know that 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 entertainment bug of being in there and, and entertaining the fans and and uh, the whole thing. But I I I've, I it never kind of I never lost that passion and that uh, feel to want to get back in the ring at least not yet. Um, so you know I, I I I love I love getting out there and just putting on a show and telling a good story and uh, having a good time and, and, and getting the reaction from the fans. That's for me, that's like, that's one of the best feelings you can possibly get. How'd you actually break in? Um, <clears throat> well, let's see. Uh, I was at Westchester university getting my degree, uh, my, my college degree. And I was, you know, still really watching it hardcore with my, with my fan, with my friends at, uh, we would go and practice the moves in the, uh, in the quad and, uh, you know, you know, watch on video and, and just rewind the videotape so we could see just what they're doing. Stop it, pause it, rewind it a million times over and, uh, and just, you know, try and do exactly what they were doing out in the courtyard. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I definitely, I know it sounds crazy, but like, and it was always my dream as a kid telling people I wanted to be a professional wrestler when I grow up, but I at least want to give it a shot. And hey, who knows? Maybe I'll be a weekend warrior and get to do some shows, some local shows, and and uh, have you know have my time to have a good time, uh, you know, drive the spotlight and have some fun. And uh, so I looked up what like wrestling programs or wrestling schools were in the area. And being from Jersey, I was lucky enough that um, the Monster Factory, uh, Pretty Boy Larry Sharp's Monster Factory, was only like half an hour, 20, 25 minutes from, from where I was, uh, actually living. So it was, it was phenomenal. So I was like, I graduated college, got my teaching degree, got my, got my job, uh, teaching. And, uh, right away I was just like, well, I gotta, 
I got to just now, now I got my college degree and, you know, made my parents happy and made myself happy for accomplishing that. And uh, I was like, I'm going to, you know, give it a call, give them a call and see. And so I called up, Larry answered and he said, oh yeah, come on down. You can do a tryout on, uh, you know, this weekend. And uh, I said, okay, great. So I went down there, tried out. And he probably said to me what he says to every other keep guy, uh, you know, you got something special. Okay. I could see it. <laughs> You know, like, yeah, the special is the the, the $3,000 it took to join the school at the time. But, uh, you know, no, but I mean, like, I, I, I felt like I did okay, considering I'd never been in a, in a wrestling ring before. And cause, just because I'm an athletic person, and um, I think I kind of picked up on it quickly, luckily. And uh, I watched it a million times and had already been practicing a lot of stuff. But, uh, but running the ropes for the first time you know, there's no way to practice that unless you're in a ring. So, uh, but I, you know, it was fun. Did some ran the ropes, did some bumps. And that was the start of it back in, uh, it was October of 2000. So yeah, October of 2000. That's when I first got, that was my first, first tryout. And, and, uh, and I remember that the, the, the uh, last payment I made was on, uh, was on uh, March 16th, 2001. So <laughs> <laughs> and that was a good day for me. I was like, all right, I'm paying this off on 316, like a mark, because uh, <laughs> I was a big Stone Cold fan. And uh, and uh, and then that was that. And it's kind of that's where it got to start. Who else was in that class with you? Um, at the time, um, there were some guys that were there who never really made it up there to, to you know, to the to the show. But um, uh, the one guy that made it up there was uh, Cliff Compton, who was, uh, uh, he was Domino from uh, Deuce and Domino tag team. He was a good friend of mine uh, that he, when, when I first joined, he, he just gotten there himself not too long before that, but he was living up in New York and um, him and a couple of my other buddies, uh, uh, they, they, they came down from Johnstown and he came down from New York and I said, Hey guys, just crash at my place. So, you know, we became fast friends and we were our own little like, you know, click and uh, and we go train on train on. Uh, what? I train Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. And they come down Fridays and I train with them on Fridays. Then we go out after that. We either go out to a club or a bar or just go grab some dinner, have a good time. And then, uh, you know, we do a show on a Saturday and, uh, you know, once we're ready for shows. Um and uh, yeah, and that was pretty much uh, it was Cliff Cliff Compton and um, the other guy who came um, had I'd already been there for a bit was Seamus. Seamus had come over um, from Ireland and uh, he took his first bumps in uh, in in the ring there at the the Monster Factory as well. Um, headbanger uh, one of the headbangers would stop in once in a while. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else that was at the time there at when I was that got up there. I don't think so. I think that was it. I think it was just, just uh, me and a couple of other guys. When you go back to that. I mean, monster factory is like legendary. So is, is that an easier way to kind of break in and make it, you know, and like get to an OVW or does that not matter that you train that, the, you know, the legendary monster factory? No, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, the Monster Factory had a really good name um, and reputation. I wasn't like, um, hey, I'm going to, you know, Joe Blow's backyard freaking wrestling arena to train with some guy who's never done anything in the business or, you know, even knew what the hell he was doing himself. Um, you know, it was it, when I went there, you know, and I looked online and I saw the Monster Factory and it said it said basically like it's the Harvard of wrestling schools. And I remember thinking, oh, OK, well, you know, and I saw the you know, some of the people they had, you know, produced. And I was like, seems seems good to me. And, uh, you know, I did research and it seemed like great. And I was right. And um, I feel like it definitely had, a, you know, helped me get the ground game of and the, the basics of what I needed um, to become a, you know a good wrestler. Uh, when I was wrestling there, Larry Sharp would you know, come in and give his two cents here and there and help a little bit. He'd do some coaching. But it was mainly a, a guy from from Canada, a real character named uh, Ed Atlas or Ed Seeley. Um, and he was like a Canadian wrestler that would come down and he was a he was a very interesting guy. And um, and sometimes, sometimes I, I questioned some of his things and he didn't like it after one point. And we had some words one time, I remember, because I, I thought it was unnecessary to have 
uh, spine buster practice. Um, <laughs> I mean, shoot, we only have a, we, we got a bump card, right? So right. Right. you only take so many bumps and, uh, and, and, and that ring, holy shit, that ring that we would practice in, um, we, we didn't practice in the show ring. Um, we practice in this, uh, little, little, uh, strip mall <clears throat> and it was, you know, little, uh, little like storefront area type. And it had two rings that were like, probably like maybe like, uh, I'd say eight to 10 inches off the ground. And they were just basically like, just no, it was just like two by eights and, and plywood and then, you know, a piece of carpet padding and then the canvas. And, uh, and it was, you know, small little rings and those things were there. If you could bump in that, then you could bump in anything, you know, you might, you, you could take bumps on the ground and you're, you're good. So, um, so when I actually got to do some shows, uh, on the indie scene and, and get into a couple other, uh, rings that, you know, I had actually, you know, I was like, holy crap. I said, this is what it's like to work in a, a nice ring. And it, was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Even when I worked on in the show ring, cause it was, a uh, it was Larry's dad, Augie's uh, uh, ring that they used, I think, for uh, what was it? The, uh, I think it was WrestleMania three, and they used uh, that ring. So it was a pretty good ring. It was a center. It has center spring in the middle, and it was great compared to to uh, what we were used to. So yeah. So long story, <laughs> man. I just went down a rabbit hole with that one. Vortex. Sorry, but yeah, it's um, the Monster Factory is definitely uh, an awesome place to to get your get some, some, um, quality training and, and, uh, to get your, your groundwork in before you kind of step it up to the next level. Yeah. So how do you get noticed eventually by OVW and get recruited and brought into OVW? Well, I mean, what happened was they were actually doing the first ever, uh, like WWE OVW, like tryout camp. Um, I remember like reading about it and they're like taking, applications to come and do a tryout to try and earn your way into a spot for OVW and possibly a development developmental contract with the WWE. And I said, wow, I was like, um, I'd been wrestling, I guess I'd been wrestling for like, I'd only been wrestling for like two years. And, um, and, but, you know, I was doing indies and I was working for uh, Donnie B who's uh, you, if you know, Donnie B and, you know, you know Mike Bucci, no, Nova's, Nova's uh, brother. Um, twin brother yep. for Phoenix, Phoenix, right? Phoenix Championship wrestling. wrestling. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they brought me on there, and and I, you know, I started wrestling as tag toll, and then I went to them, and they, they uh, put me, made me titanium tank toll, and with platinum Mike Preston, uh, who was like, it was basically my first ever tag team partner, and uh, it was pretty, it was cool, it was fun. Um, did some shows with them and had a good time, and I learned some more stuff, and it was great because they had some good names coming in. They were having like Eddie Guerrero come in, and and you know a lot of they were having some 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 really good names and and um, and uh, and you know just learned so much uh, from from just being out there on the independent scene, and uh, that was the first time I got to to work other people than people I had trained with, so that was really awesome. Um, but I mean to get back to the the, the how did I get the OVW? Uh, they were having that tryout, and I said, shoot, I'm gonna I'll send in my application. So I. I, uh, you know, sent the application and I sent my picture in, and, you know, did all the stuff, jumped through all the hoops and, you know, time goes by and, and, you know, I'm not hearing anything. And I'm like, all right, well, obviously there had to be a, a ton of applications because it was like, they're taking people from all over the world. And, um, and I was like, you know what, uh, I was like, let me just, I don't know. I guess something said, told me just check, just check to see if they got it. So I actually called, I called a uh, OVW arena and um, and Danny Davis's girlfriend Julie uh, answered the phone, and um, and I said, hey, I was like, you know, hey, hi, my my name's John Toland, and uh, I, I sent in I sent in an application. I just want to make sure you got it. I know I don't want to seem crazy or anything like that, but I just just want to check, make sure it got to you okay. And she said, ah, no problem. She's such a sweet person. She was one of my favorite people when I got there too. Um, and so she went and she actually checked, and she goes, I, I don't see anything. And I was like, oh, man, she's like, she's like, look, uh, the deadline, obviously, you know, it's, it's the deadline was like the, like the next day. And I think that's why it's kind of worrying. And um, she said, look, you just, just send it in. I, I, I know that you're sending it in. So, uh, you know, even if it doesn't get here tomorrow, I'll make sure that it's seen. I said, okay, great. Thank you. 
and I sent it and sure enough, uh, you know, it got to her and, um, I was lucky enough that I checked because I would never have been there. And, uh, so that's how I got, and I was one of the lucky people to be selected to come and, and train. They took 50 people for that out of like, I, I mean, from what I understood, it was thousands and thousands of, of people sending, uh, tapes and submissions in, and I was just lucky enough to be one of them. So, so do you have to pay to, to train with them or, or they pay you? Well, when you try out, when you first go there for the tryout, um, I think, yeah, I think that, yeah, I think the, I think the tryout, I think the tryout had to have cost something. I, I it was probably, I don't know, the prior, tryout was probably like $500 for the week or something like that. Something along those lines uh, had to be, I mean, they're not going to just have you go there for free. So you, you go there and then you're, you're, you know, everyone went and stayed at a hotel that was near the arena and, um, and we'd get bussed over every day. Um, and we did like, you know, it was an all day long tryout. Uh, and you had Dr. Tom Pritchard there, who was at the time, you know, he was the, the uh, head of developmental talent for watching the guys, and, you know, reporting back to to, uh, to to Johnny Ace or whatever. And then, um, and, uh, but, you know, then there was, uh, who was there at the time? Obviously, Danny Davis, Jim Cornette. Um, uh, and then, uh, oh, Rocky Johnson was there. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> he was a character. He's cool. Um but yeah, there was there were guys there who were watching and, and kind of taking notes and and of course obviously Rip Rogers and fall, you know, I can't forget Rip because he's the man. But uh but yeah, and he was, you know, at the time training the developmental guys uh under contract. So, you know, we went through all this training and you know, I was just I was nervous the whole time because I was like, you know, seeing all these other people that had a lot of talent and you know, Christopher Daniels was there, <laughs> which was he didn't need to be there. He is just so good. Uh, you know, he was good enough. He just, I don't, I guess he was just went there to maybe get a look again. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, there was some talented people there and talented people that ended up like myself getting signed uh, from that class. There was definitely um, a good handful of people actually that came from that class. They got signed and moved on. So, yeah. What do you think? about you? I hate that guy. No, I'm kidding. Jimmy Cornette is, <laughs> and some people do, some people can't stand him, but Jimmy Cornette, I mean, God, man, without, without like sound like a broken record. Cause every time I do a podcast, I have to put him over because he was probably my biggest supporter um, when I was there. And not only my biggest supporter, he gave me the biggest push and he, um, taught me an immense amount about the business, about um, psychology, about, uh, you know, tag team, especially because, I mean, who's better to talk to about tag teams than Jimmy Cornette? I mean, you know, um, but I mean, you know, who's better. There's not many better people to talk to in general about, you know, wrestling and the business in general, because he's just phenomenal. He's an encyclopedia. He's a genius. And uh, I mean, that's my that's my opinion anyway, and I'm sticking to it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he liked me and, uh, and I was very fortunate to, uh, have, uh, learned from him and be a part of, uh, be a part of his show, you know? When you do get picked up and signed, they immediately want to put you with, uh, Chris Cage, AK Chris Pavone, or was that something that comes along later on? Um, no, actually it was, it was when I first got there, I remember, <sighs> because we did the tryouts and I, you know, everything, you know, you didn't hear anything right away. Um, I did the tryouts in like February and um, I was, I got, I, I remember I was, um, I had stopped teaching cause I wanted to, I was, I was, I was, I was like all in by now. I was like, okay, I just, I'm done teaching. I'm going to do something else. And so I was lucky enough to, to have a friend who owned a, a fitness store for home gyms and stuff like that. So he let me be a sales manager there. And so I just, I just, work out and then if people came in i'd sell them some gym equipment and then get back to working out and it was it was awesome so uh so uh and it was good paying too um and i just remember just getting a call from uh from jimmy it was like just like the middle of the day and uh he's like he's like this tank it's like yeah i was like hey i was like yeah and, and i i saw it was a a number from not my area code and i said and i was like hey it's jim Cornette. how you doing I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. How are you? And uh, he's like, 
I'm great. I'm great. Uh, so uh, how would you like to come to OBW and work towards a developmental contract with the WWE? And uh, I was like, I was like, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I was like, so like at that moment over the moon, I felt like a, a little kid on Christmas and um, like, I just won publisher's clearinghouse or something. And, um, <clears throat> and I said, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm there. And he goes, how he goes, he goes, he goes, how soon can you be there? Here. And I said, well, how soon do you need me? He goes, as soon as you can get here. I said, okay. I said, great. I said, uh, and, and it was, I think it was the end, actually the end of, I think it was like the end of April. And I said, I'll, I said, just give me like a week, two weeks at the most to, to just get my affairs in order and pack my stuff up and I'll get right out there. And, uh, cause I didn't want to screw my friend over who gave me a job. Um, I want to make sure he was covered and, uh, and got it all together and, I'll never forget. It was May, May 3rd, 2003, uh, which happened to also be der Derby weekend, Kentucky Derby weekend. I, I, I drove on out there, took the 12, 12 hour drive straight through excited as hell. And I remember I rolled into town and uh, I, I really had never seen anything in town other than the hotel and the arena. Cause we just get bussed back and forth. And, uh, and I just remember just getting there and being like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is definitely Definitely different from Jersey, but I'm so excited. And uh, and uh, that was kind of how that started. And when I and I know I'm rambling on, but uh, I like to give backstory. But um, when I first started working there, that I, I got there on a I got there on a, a Saturday, and um, I remember I practiced for a couple of days, and then they had the TV taping on Wednesday, and um, they decided, you know, hey, we're gonna we're gonna put them on the show. And my very first match was actually against uh, – <clears throat> my very first match was against uh, Doug Basham uh, for, for the OVW heavyweight title, uh, which was pretty crazy. And I was like, oh, I was like, I guess the pressure's on. So uh, that, was, that was pretty crazy. And, and Doug was super, super awesome, super nice and professional. And he, he could have he just, you know – he could have just worked me over, you know, and just, you know, just got over strong on me, but he get, he let me have a match and he let me, you know, get shine and he let me do my thing and uh, made me look good. And uh, it went well enough uh, that they liked it. And the next week uh, uh, at the time, Randy Orton was there and uh, they gave me a match against Randy. And uh, he was, uh, he was actually just, you know, recovering from a, a shoulder injury, I think it was. And uh, so they put me against, um, against Orton and, uh, you know, he was great and uh, he was cool. And, and we went over some stuff and he said, would you mind if I uh, gave you the uh, diamond cutter since Dal Diamond Dallas Page isn't in there anymore in the WWE? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And so uh, so he gave me the diamond cutter twice, which ended up becoming the RKO. So, yep. And that was the first time he ever gave the RKO to anyone. So I was the first guy to take that move. And uh, so that was pretty cool. Yeah. And, uh, that was, uh, that was cool. And then, and then next thing, you know, um, I thought, you know, I was probably going to continue being on the singles, uh, and, um, they're going to build me up that way. But, um, Nova, Mike Gucci, uh, Simon Dean, whatever, you know, whatever name, <clears throat> uh, he ended up, um, he was originally in the tag team with, with, uh, Chris Cage, um, in adrenaline. And, um, he actually ended up tearing his, uh, as, a uh, medial ligament and had to be out. He had to, you know, get, you know, recover, get surgery. And so Jimmy Cornette said, Hey, tanks from Jersey. You're from Jersey. We'll do an angle where your boys and which we did know each other. And he goes, your boys. And we'll just do it. Like you're, you're going to have him step in for you and uh, you know, tag with cage. And so that happened. And like, I think we, it was either the first match or the second match we went out and we beat, we beat, uh, you know, the, uh, I think it was Lance, Lance Cade and uh, Jindrak or something from uh, Bowling Services and uh, for the for the uh, Southern Tag Team Champions. And so it was it was a real whirlwind of a um, beginning for my career at OVW. And it was pretty awesome. Um, I was really lucky, and really fortunate. And uh, but this was before I had I hadn't got my contract yet. I was just working with OVW, working towards a contract. When do you get the contract? When do you get it? So. I ended up wrestling. I got there in May and um, 
worked uh, for OVW without a contract until I think it was beginning or mid October. So I went the summer without, you know, the contract and I guess just proven myself. And I think it was one of those things where, all right, well, let's just see what the guy has got. At, which I get it. I got to prove myself. First, I definitely had, which I didn't mind doing. Um, I was just thankful for the opportunity to get a shot at it. And, um, and also I think, you know, I think my height had something to do with it, you know, cause I was, I was a really big guy and I was very athletic and, and I, you know, I could, I could do, you know, I could sell, I could talk on the mic and, and all that stuff. But I think, I think, you know, Vince likes big guys. So, and, uh, and Johnny Ace also likes, you know, to make Vince happy. Um, so I think, uh, I think that was a little bit of a challenge uh, because if I was uh, the size I was and a couple inches taller, or even if I was six foot, shoot, I'd probably still be in the business right now, but uh, up there, but, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, it was pretty much, I think, combination of just proved myself and, uh, you know, had to overcome the height issue. When did they decide did. to put you with Chad? The name that shall not be spoken. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, Chris and I had some really a really good run together. We had won the uh, OVW title uh, multiple times, and um, basically, uh, Chad Chad got signed. And I, I just, I remember, I'll, I'll never forget. I remember hearing, hearing it from Dr. Tom, Tom, Dr. Tom was, was at VW visiting and, and checking everyone out and, and, uh, you know, giving his usual speeches that he does and, and helping us out. And, um, and he goes, Oh yeah. And uh, we just signed a guy. He's, he's, he comes to all the shows wherever he's, close to and and he draw he's always backstage smiling and it's a and he's a perfect example of someone who just is persistent and won't get take no for an answer always back there with a smile shaking hands and 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 i was like oh this guy sounds like you know this guy sounds like a good guy you know it sounds like someone's a hard worker and you know someone that's uh you know willing to do whatever it takes to, to get a shot and uh and sure enough, he's like, yeah, he'll be coming next week. Uh, and there was a couple guys that actually knew who he was. And uh, they're like, oh, my God, this guy, this guy got signed. Oh, my gosh. And I'm like, wow, what's up with him? And um, they're like, man, he's he's a little he's a little different. He's a little different. I'm like, oh, OK. So sure enough, he comes and and there he is. He's like my height, similar build. And uh, and uh, and next thing I know, it's. They're, they're, the WWE is talking about putting us two together because we are same height, same build. You know, you know, I'm better looking, but you know, but uh, I'm just kidding. I'm not. Um, but it's just you know, when we got linked together, um, I'd already kind of got a feel for who he was, and um, it wasn't he wasn't really my cup of tea um, from a couple different perspectives, personality, um, and uh, also psychology. Um, but Hey, that's all, that's all good. Um, so what ended up happening was, uh, Jimmy decided since they wanted to put us together, he'll do this whole angle where Chad comes in, he's my cousin and he's just really excited about me and my opportunity to become champion and all this stuff. And, and, uh, he drives a wedge between me and Chris and then, uh, ends up, you know, Long story short, short, I turn on Chris, I become a heel, and uh, then we're going to have a big angle with me and him, and we're going to, you know, compete for the heavyweight title and all this stuff. And right when that was about to happen, I, uh, I was, I actually tore my bicep for the first time, and um, <clears throat> and, uh, and that sucked because um, I had just torn it, and um, a couple of days later, uh, all the writers and Steph McMahon and uh, you know all you. Know, all the big wigs were coming uh, to come and take a look at everybody and see, you know, who's got, you know, something to give them right now because they're getting ready to bring more people up. And so I said, well, shit, I am not getting surgery. I'm not doing it. I'm going to, I'm going to just keep wrestling and I'm not going to lose my opportunity. 
Um, so Stephanie came with all the writers and everything. And I, I did a mat. I did, I think I did one or two matches and cut a couple promos or something. And I, I felt I really did well. And I, and I, I was like, that was solid. I really had, had some good stuff there. And, um, and sure enough, I got out and I remember I was like, I was just thankful. I got through the matches with my torn bicep and I went to the back and I was getting a drink of water and, uh, and, uh, Tommy, Tommy dreamer came back uh, to me because uh, at the time he was now doing the, uh, the uh, developmental stuff. And he said, um, he said, uh, Tank, um, good news and bad news. Stephanie loves you. She loves you. She loves what you're doing and she wants to bring you up right now. Um, bad news is I had to tell her that you tore your bicep and dude, you have to get surgery. And uh, he goes, you can't not get surgery. And, um, and I was like, oh, man. And as he's telling me, Stephanie comes back and she's like, tank, because I was, I was upset, man. And uh, as she's like, hey, don't worry about it. You, your job's going to be here. You're, you're still, you, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to let you go or anything like that. Just get better. And when you get better, we'll bring you up. Okay. I said, all right, all right. Okay. I'm like, hopefully that's not lip service. And she was, she was true. She was true to her word. And, uh, you know, I got, I, you know, I, I went and got surgery. And the cool thing about it was, was Jimmy continued to use me throughout the whole time. I never, I, I don't think I missed a show. Um, I might've missed one show where, where they said I was attacked backstage by Chris Cage. Cause then it got turned into part of the show where I, and I'd come out in a wheelchair and a neck brace and, and then black eyes and, and bandages around my head. And, and I, you know, I, I was overreacting it on purpose as a heel to say, Hey, he attacked me and all this stuff when he never really attacked me. Um, and it was fun. It was fun. I, I, I blamed him for everything bad that had happened to me. I, I blamed him for, you know, being, uh, uh, even blamed them saying that I, I couldn't have sex anymore because I you know, couldn't get aroused because of the, the trauma that I had had taken from him. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a fun time, but, but yeah, but that's how I got linked up with Chad. So when they do put you guys together and they do end up putting you on the main roster, what is up with the game, the name, the gimmick, like, why the change and why the dicks and why not the brown bombers? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so basically, it was just something that that happens on a, a, a whim because uh, what was what what had originally happened was when we were going up originally, they wanted uh, us to go up and be um, Nova's or Simon Dean's like little henchmen. They wanted that that he wanted they wanted us to be his lackey. Like Nova's, like ah, I want these guys to come and they'll be my lackeys. They'll be my guys, my henchmen, and. Um, you know, because we're big guys and, you know, he'll come out and he's doing that whole fitness routine uh, eventually ended up being the Gemini that ended up being with him. But um, but so the way it happened, though, was they're like, OK, well, what we'll do, though, is we'll bring them in and they'll just come out of the crowd and they'll just take people out like the, the people in the ring. Whoever gets done their match, they'll take them out. So whoever was wrestling at the time. Um, when the match was over, we'd run out from the crowd wearing black tank tops and black slacks. And then we just slide into the ring and just, just start destroying whoever was in there. We just hit them with finishers and all that stuff. And for a few weeks, they're like, who are these guys? You know, like, you know, and then one week they even called us the Tolans. I was like, all right, cool. All right. I can, I can handle that. I can, I can, I can deal with that. And then, um, and then I think it was like the very next week, uh, that was not mentioned again, the Tolans, but uh, I remember we were in there and we were, we were laying out like the Mexicals or something like that. I can't remember. I think it was Mexicals. And I just remember um, being a hyped up and, and like, I just remember just like just ripping off my shirt real quick and, and just throwing it. And, um, and we got to the back and Vince, Vince looks at me and he's like, you know what, the way you, he's like, the way you ripped off that shirt, it, uh, he goes, I loved it. You guys remind me of Chippendales. Next week, I want you guys to come back dressed as Chippendales. I just want to see what it would look like. You know, just like I got an idea. And, uh, and I was like, our, our, I mean, you know, okay, Vince, you know, what am I going to say? No to Vince. Uh, you know, I was like, all right. So went to our seamstress, got some Chippendale outfits made with the cufflinks and the tearaway pants and the bow ties and the suspenders and all that stuff. Came back, showed him, and he's like, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I think that we're, that's what we're going to do with you. Yep, that's what we're going to do with you. Uh, I was like, okay. 
I was like, all right, you know, I'll make it work, you know? So all, already in my head, I'm like, okay, well, what's, what's my whole character going to be like? And, and so I started thinking of people that were kind of like similar to that style that I can kind of feed off of. And I was like, you know, it would be cool if it was like a, like a Val Venus, like ravishing Rick Rude type of mix up, you know, kind of that kind of, kind of flavor. And, uh, and Stephanie said, well, they want you to come up with a name. If you can think of some, some wrestling names, it's kind of like wrestling, but Chippendale or sexy or whatever. And so we're, you know, you know, brainstorming over the week. And uh, one of the names that came up that I, you know, I thought, I thought was pretty cool. Um, I love the thought of being called um, weapons of mass seduction. I was like, that would be cool. You know, it's wrestling, but it's sexy. And um, that'd be, that'd be cool. So I told Stephanie, I remember everybody was in the ring. You know how you're warming up before the match starts. Everyone's in there training and stuff. And the writers are out there. The agents are out there, rather. Uh, not the writers, they're agents. And, um, and I'm telling Stephanie right, on, right by the ramp. And I'm like, okay, Stephanie, how about this? Weapons of mass seduction. And she's like, I love it. She's like, that's great. That's great. And then out of the corner of my ear, I hear, why don't we call them the Swinging Richards? And I'm like... I look over and there's Michael Hayes ch- chirping. And I'm like, that motherfucker. Um, I'm like, all right, I see what's going on here. So uh, so he's like, ah, that's hilarious. Uh, and of course, you know, a couple of the other boys that are kissing his ass are laughing. And uh, and so he's like, you know what? I'm going to go tell Vince that right now. So he goes and, you know, he goes off and he's, I guess, I guess he went to Vince or whoever the writers or whoever. And because sure enough, it's like, man it's like maybe five ten minutes before i'm getting ready to go do my match and stephanie comes up to me and she's like tank um so there's a change um so you're not going to be weapons of mass seduction um you're not you're not going to be the swinging richards um it was too close to stevie richards and um uh, then they thought of maybe just calling you the swinging dicks and that's too on the nose And, uh, so we're going to, we're going to call you the dicks. And I said, okay. All right. Okay. I'm going to roll with this. I'll make this work. And I said, Steph, I said, is there any way that we could spell this D I X? And she's like, no, they want, they want you to spell D I C K S. And I was like, all right. All right. Um, I'm going to do what I got to do. It's like, and I'm thinking to myself, Oh, my mom's going to be so proud. So, but it's, it's all good. But, um, so yeah, so that was kind of how the dicks got its name. It's just me ripping off my damn tank top and Vince getting a boner from it. Uh, not really getting a boner. Maybe I'm just kidding. Just kidding, Vince. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but no, um, but yeah, so that's, that was the idea. So, yeah. When you look at it, is it a rib though, or is it like a legit gimmick? What do you think? Honestly, at the time, I'm going to say, coming from Vince directly, it's not a rib. Um, I don't think it. I don't think it's a rib coming from Vince directly, because I know he always wants to put out a good product, and but I also know he's also put out some stinkers, especially during that time. We got to remember. During this time, it wasn't just the dicks, all right? They took a guy who was a great worker, Paul Birchall, and um, they originally had him with uh, William Regal, and he's because he's also from from England. And Paul Birchall is is awesome, and he had this cool freaking gimmick going. He he called himself the Ripper, and he was awesome, and it was he was vicious, and it was it was it was I loved it. Uh, and Paul is such a great worker and they decided to make him a pirate. Why? Because Pirates of the Caribbean was popular at the time. So he'll, they'll make him a Jack Sparrow type of guy, you know? And so, you know, they decided to do that. And then they decided to make a seven foot monster, Matt Morgan, a stutter. You don't need a gimmick. You're seven foot. That is your gimmick. You are a big monster you don't need anything else and an athletic built monster so it's like and they decide to give him a stutter 
And then they decide to, uh, you know, what else that they did that, oh, they, they, you know, the boogeyman, but the boogeyman ended up getting over, you know, so that's awesome. You know, boogeyman got over and I love Marty. And, um, and, uh, and they, let's see, oh, they gave, they gave uh, Jillian Hall a big mole. Uh, they decided to put a big mole on the side of Jillian's face as a diva. So, I mean, like they did all this goofy stuff that was coming from Vince and, um, and the writers in general. So, you know, who knows? I think, you know, it's like, and I was, you know, heard it from Tommy Dreamer or I heard it from uh, Dr. Tom. They say, hey, look, you're going to get up there. You know, you don't know how long you're going to have up there. You might have, you might have, a, a, you might have a, a month. You might have a year. You might have a, a decade or a lifetime of wrestling. He goes, you just don't know. He goes, there's a lot of things that, that, that happen. He goes, but you know, one of the things is, that, you know, when they, they we, when you go up there, they're going to throw a lot of stuff at the wall and whatever doesn't stick, they'll just get rid of. So you got to just hope that whatever you get, you can make it stick. And that's what I tried my best to do. It was just, it was kind of hard um, being a couple factors. One, my tag partner, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It was, it was, it was a difficult, you know, tag team relationship. Um, but the other difficult part was here you are in this era where they were actually trying to be fan. They're trying to be like family friendly at this time. They're really trying to get into that family friendly type of, of thing where it was more geared toward the kids again. And, and, um, so here we are, we're the dicks and we're on SmackDown, which is regular network television. And that was my concern. I brought that up to Stephanie. I said, Stephanie, I said, my, I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I can to get this gimmick over. And I said, I want to, I want to make it work and I want to make it great. And um, I'm going to do everything I can. I said, but I, I, I'm a little worried that, you know, being on SmackDown on network television, you know, that's going to be hard for us because we're not going to be able to get away with as much and do as much to make this, this gimmick get over. Um, I said, this is definitely a gimmick that should be on like on raw where it's cable television. They go later at night. You can get away saying more and doing more. And, and um, you know, that was, I told her and she goes, oh, we'll figure it out. We'll make it work. Well, don't worry. We'll figure it out. And, and sure enough, like I was lucky enough to be able to uh, write my own promos and vignettes for backstage for us, for our interviews. And I, I, I would they'd say, just, you know, get these points across and, and make it funny and uh and you know make it like a make it make it make it your own make it the dicks i said okay and i was writing all this you know fun stuff you know you know of course double entendres and you know all that stuff about you know being being a real hard and veiny and you know you know describing you know the male genitalia but as ourselves and, and the dicks and you know saying stuff like we're hard to beat and stuff like that you know just the, this stupid easy stuff that you know but could get over and be funny um, and you know, while we're doing the vignettes, like all the people off, off camera, just, you know, loving it and laughing and they'd say cut and everyone's laughing their asses off. And, and, uh, people like one of the guys comes back, hey, uh, triple H and, and Vince are laughing their asses off in the office. They loved it. They loved it. I'm like, awesome. Awesome. And then like 15 minutes later, uh, they'd come back to me and they'd be like, Hey, look, we got to reshoot that because you can't say this, this, and this. And you got to change your, change it up. And I'm like, and, and in my head, I'm just like, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, it's got a limited shelf life when you can only do so much. So you kind of get handcuffed. But like I said, like, I was just trying to make it work the best I could. And if it's not risque, it's kind of lame and corny and can't do much with the characters. I mean, you could kind of like have good matches or you know, wrestle the road warrior, the uh, the Legion of Doom quote unquote at the time or the Mexicals, Eminem, I mean, whoever. But when you're not able to really fully do the gimmick, it comes off as lame. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I <laughs> sometimes my friends who just want to bust my balls will send me like, like links to like, uh, oh, check this out. You're one of the worst one of the worst 10 te- what you're in the top 10 of worst tag teams of all time and and, and uh and uh oh look look you're ranked as one of the most gayest tag teams of all time too and i'm like ah, well yeah I, I, yeah hey what are you gonna do at least at least i'm in the top 10 for something but uh but yeah 
So, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing, like it, it's, it's, it's bittersweet because I will always be grateful for trying the business and getting and not, not, not giving up on my dream and, and actually being able to get to the show and, and, and make it like, I'll never like take that away from myself. But like, there's always going to be a part of me that was like, man, son of a bitch. If I, man, if, if just this, or if just that, if I just not been in this tag team, or if I, you know, or, you know, or, or if I solo or if I was with Chris Cage or, or whatever, you know, a million different, different ifs, like if this, if that, you know, um, I always tell myself like, man, I, I think, I think it kind of, I could have had a better turnout, you know, a better outcome than what I did. And, uh, but it is what it is. And um, it just stinks. Cause I don't feel like, I don't feel like people, um, fans um, that saw me up in the WWE fans that saw me in OVW uh, or other places, ring of honor or, or, you know, the Indies or wherever those fans saw tank Toland and, you know, what I was capable of, uh, as far as, you know, being a worker, uh, overall, um, the WWE universe, they, they got to see a very small little, uh, very watered down, uh, part of who I, who I was as a, as a wrestler, a worker in general. Yeah. So, and that kind of bothers me because I wanted to be able to really, you know, show, show all of my abilities. So, so were you surprised when you guys get released or, or do you get set back to OVW? What happened? Um, so basically a couple of things happened. Um, one thing being that, uh, you know, the gimmick was just, you know, the gimmick was the gimmick and, uh, you know, you tried the best with it, but it, you know, you, you know, after a while it's, you know, the dicks is the joke is going to get old, you know, real quick. If you can't evolve, from it if you can't make it something else or make or, or you know grow in some way um you know the dick's got to grow and that's you know just a fact of life and uh so uh but basically because of the gimmick being you know getting tired real quick and uh also you know chad and i you know it's there's you know most people by now know that chad and i had this big blow up fight and uh that was you know due to wrestlers court and him getting a lot of heat with the boys uh time and time again and it just came down to it and uh and it was it was unfortunate because i never i never wanted to i never wanted to hurt him or or anything like that but you know shit happens and uh if you're if you're gonna throw the first punch you you better be ready to you better be ready. Let's just say that. So, Damn, so it didn't end up well for you guys. Well, yeah, I mean, it definitely didn't end up well for him that night. But, um, but yeah, I mean that that pissed me off more though because I never want to, I never want to, even though oh my gosh, there was times I wanted to kill him, um, but I never wanted to actually hurt him, and um, and I never wanted him to give in to what the boys were doing with hazing him and stuff because you know they you know that's part of the 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 deal when you're when you go up there especially during that time man i mean it was that time you know a lot of people will tell you that being up in that locker room when we were there was a it was a tough time there was a lot of cancerous people up there uh and it just a negative vibe um and uh you know we got up there and and you know they just you know they immediately start ribbing you and I, they rid me, I don't even know how many times. And I took it and I smiled and I laughed it off or I no sold it. And uh, to the point where I remember, um, I remember it was uh, Chris Benoit took me outside after one of the shows and or during one of the shows. And, uh, you know, he's like, hey, Tank, I just want to let you know, like the boys were talking and um, you're taking the ribbon, you know, you're taking it great, man. You're taking it like a champ. And, you know, we're not going to bust your balls anymore. We like you. You're a good guy. And I was like, I was like, thanks, Chris. I really appreciate that. It means a lot. And, and uh, his next sentence was, but you got to get, you got to get a hold of your boy, your boy, man. Guys do not like him. Uh, he's got a lot of heat and he complains about everything. You know, you took the ribs well, and he's always complaining that, come on, guys, come on, give me a break, blah, blah, blah. 
And, uh, you know, that's not going to do well for him, but also your tag team partner. So it kind of, it goes hand in hand, which I knew, you know, you, that's one of the, that's one of the things it's about being a tag team, man. You're not just, you know, you're not just riding by yourself and, uh, you know, that heat can get transferred onto you, whether they like you or not. So, so that's kind of, that's kind of what happened with that. Um, yeah. And you guys get released or like what happened? Oh yeah. So, uh, sorry. So there I go. Taking you into a vortex. Uh, it's my ADD. Uh, yeah. So basically, um, it was after that fight, um, we went on tour that, that fight happened in Mexico city. And, um, I remember we came back and we did some more TV. Um, and then we went to Japan and then after we came back from Japan, um, I think it was like the next week, uh, I remember I was driving in the car and, uh, I get a call, I answered the call and it's, uh, Johnny Ace and, um, I'm just driving down the road uh, on a conference call with Johnny Ace and, and Chad's on the other line. Uh, and, uh, and he's like, Oh yeah, boys. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm sorry to tell you, but you know, we gotta let you go. We got, we gotta let you go. We gotta release you, you know, uh, you know, the gimmick, it just, you know, wasn't getting over. And, uh, when it comes down to it, guys, you know, you just, you can't, you can't go fighting in a hotel. You can't go fighting in a hotel. Uh, you know, we're a publicly traded company. It's not a good look. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's like, so yeah, it's not good. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, get the fuck out of here with this. Tell me about the fight bullshit. I was like, the boys first off baited it, you know, and second, you got dudes that were freaking all pilled up, all pilled up. Some of them getting locked out of the rooms naked and, and in a hotel, a crowded hotel, they still had their jobs, you know? So, you know, it, it's like, it's like, fuck you. You know, like, I know what the deal was. I know what the deal was. You, A, you just didn't like the gimmick. It was fine. You didn't like the gimmick and uh, you didn't like me and you didn't like Chad. That's all good. So that's good. No problem. Just be real. Don't, don't tell me because, because it followed up with this. It followed up with, and you know, and it, it, of course he, I guarantee he says this to everyone else. Cause I've talked to other people and it's the same thing. Oh, you know, uh, wrestling, it's a revolving door. You know, it's uh, you know, the, the business, it's a revolving door here. You know, you go away for a little while. Let's let things cool down. Let's let people forget about the dicks. And uh, then, you know, we'll work on getting you buys back in and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and, and, you know, part of it wasn't was, you know, when he let us go, it was like, like I said, he didn't like the gimmick. He didn't like us. Uh, and um, and, uh, you know, also, uh, from what I understand, they didn't want to get rid of me, but they felt they had to from like things I heard uh, from the office. Um, but they they didn't want to get rid of me, but they had to get rid of me because I was part of the tag team and part of the whole thing that was going on with the, um, with the wrestlers court and stuff, uh, they're calling Chad a faggot and gay and all this other stuff. And I think that they were worried that if they just released Chad, Chad could have some kind of lawsuit or, you know, discrimination or what have you. So yeah, I think they just said, well, it's better just to get rid of both of them and it's no sweat off Johnny's, uh, Johnny's, uh, you know, back anyway. So, so, yeah, so that's kind of what happened with that. But, you know, so we got the old wish you best in your future endeavors statement, you know, so. Did you ever think any of the reps went too far or wrestlers went too far? Not really. I mean, look, it, it I, I wasn't eating shit. I wasn't drinking piss. It was stupid, stupid stuff. It was like one time they, they, uh, I, I came out from the, from back from the match and, my, my bag wasn't there and I was looking around for it and, you know, I hear the shower running and they had my bag under the shower with all my stuff in it, all my gear in it. Big deal. So I have wet clothes. Okay. I zipped it up with the water in there, pour, pulled it back out, watched the rest of the show, went to the tour bus with everyone out, pulling it right behind me with water just streaming out, <laughs> threw it under the bus with the rest of the luggage and didn't say a word. Uh, another one was uh, came back from the match. Wear my clothes, 
looking for my biz cash clothes and um, nowhere to be found. I'm looking and there they are up. Oh, I see them. They're glued to the, to the wall, glued to the wall, like a person. And so I took them down, took them down, put them on, didn't say a word, sat in the chair, watched the rest of the show. Didn't say a word, got on the bus. That was it. Didn't say a word. And that's, and that's the kind of stuff that happened. It was nothing, nothing really major. Um, it was just, you know, just fucking around. So it wasn't anything like they were, you know, you know, taking foreign objects and shoving them up our asses or anything like that, you know? So, you know, but some people could take it better than others. Some people are real soft and some people are, you know, got the Gen X mentality where you're like, ah, oh, fuck it. You know? So that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's just funny. Not horrible. You know, just funny. Uh, yeah, rib, I mean, funny prank. Look, yeah. I mean, yeah, it sucks when it happens to you because you're like, shit, my clothes are soaking wet. I'm going, okay, I'll, I'll, this is, you know, it is what it is. So, but you know, but you know that that's a temporary thing and that they're just testing you and that you just roll with it. That's just like anything in life. When people fuck with you, you just, you know, I mean, like if it's a real world, they fuck with you, you fuck back. But in the business, you know, like if you're just like the same as if you're on a, a freaking sports team. You know, like I played sports my whole life and, and or, or any other thing where it's like, a you know, a, a brotherhood or something like that. Like, you know, it's like people will, will mess with you a little bit. It's kind of like an initiation. And then you're one of the boys. You know, that's it. They want to see if you could take the punches. So then you guys can all have a laugh and some beers later. That's it. You know, see if you fit in. That's it. As we hit the wind up, we'll head towards the finish here. Hmm? When you look at the, the run, it's like, OK. Maybe it's not what you wanted it to be. Did you ever want to head back there? Or was that a goal? Or I know you had a nice fun run in Ring of Honor, but did you want to head back to the WWE at, at any point? Oh, man. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, of course. I mean, I had dreams. I still have dreams to this day. Like, I mean, literal dreams, not just like, you know, figuratively, oh, I daydream about it. No, I mean, I literally have dreams where I'm getting the shot again. And it's like I'm super excited and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm here, and 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 Vince is giving me another shot, and and this time I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna show him what I got, and uh, I'm gonna make this work, and and it's always something crazy too, of course, like shit, my boots are in the car, I'm up next, <laughs> I gotta go get them real quick and put them on, uh, like something crazy like that, like or or something something ridiculous, but but yeah, I mean, I, I have dreams about it all the time, and um, I, I miss it, I miss being, uh, especially performing at that level. Uh, where you have all the fans there. I mean, like the bigger for me, it was always like the bigger the audience, the more energy and just the more excited I got. And uh, it was just awesome. So that's that's also, you know, why I absolutely loved working with the Ring of Honor because um, they had great crowds. That's why, I mean, my, my bar none, my favorites OVW, just because um, it was like, you know, so the, just like it was a great arena. The fans were the best they're amazing fans they're loyal and uh and just phenomenal people and uh just you know just a great time couldn't have been a better run show um ring of honor you know obviously the fans were great there and the locker room the locker room was great there because so that that was the thing like ovw was like it was literally like everyone was family in ovw there was no fucking around there was no heat there was no bullshit we're all just family and we're all trying to get each other over so we can get up to the big show and just, you know, make it up there. And like, I'm, I'm friends to this day with so many of the guys from OVW because it's really a, it's really a family. It's a brotherhood, a fraternity, uh, and, you know, and, uh, you know, couldn't have been better. And the locker room in, uh, at Ring of Honor when I was there, phenomenal, phenomenal. And the guys, some of the guys that were working there, I was like, why are these guys not up in the WWE right now? And they ended up getting up there, Claudio Casagnoli who, you know, Cesaro and, uh, and then like, you know, guys, of uh, Matt Seidel, uh, freaking, uh, uh, Chris, uh, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Danielson and guys like that, you know, Chris Hero, who, who they, they could have used him so much better. And, and Colt Cabana, which is another one they, they fucked up. So, you know, but, uh, yeah, so it was really good. So those two locker rooms were phenomenal. WWE's locker room at the time, uh, I'm hoping it's better now, but it was, it was shitty at the time, but you know, but I still made it work. So yeah. I don't even know if I answered your question. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's next wrestling wise? 
Uh, you know, oh no, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to do some more uh, local shows. Uh, you know, whoever wants to book me, they can book me. They can find me on Facebook. They can just, you know, type in Tank Toland or, you know, John Toland uh, and then Instagram on Tank Toland. Um, you know, that that's easy enough to come find me there. Uh, you know, I'll work anywhere, really. Uh, but, you know, right now, since I'm in the tri-state area, Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania type of area, uh, you know, I, I, you know, mainly working around here, but I'll work anywhere. Shoot. I would like to go back to I would like to actually go back to Louisville and do some shows there because I just love to get back in front of those fans. They're they're a lot of fun. I actually went there over uh, over the summer back to OVW to check it out and uh, hung out with Al Snow and, and uh, Doug Basham in the production room and stuff and watched them put on the show, which they're doing a great job with uh, with things since uh, since uh, Danny isn't there anymore. And they're doing great things. And same same with uh, uh, Danny Cage, uh, McDonald uh, over at the Monster Factory. I mean, it was so it's so good seeing seeing um, Danny take that 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 uh, that school and keep it going. Not only keep it going strong, but just really building it up to something even, you know, better than it actually was in my opinion. Cause I mean, some great people came from the monster factory, but training there and seeing the, you know, what you trained in and stuff, it was very simple and humble. And he, he put together a great place and they do great things and they have great philosophy and psychology and um, a great way of being there. So uh, I give a lot of credit to Danny cage to, to really, building that up even more, getting guys signed, getting girls signed and, uh, and keeping it, keeping it alive. So, you know, that's awesome. So oh, any other, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to oh, say any yeah. other like bookings on the horizon, any uh, big places to be, you'll be working. Uh, not, not as of now. No, not, not as of now. I would, Hey, look, like, like I said, I am, I am definitely ready to, to get back and uh, do a lot more shows and uh, go full steam again. Um, I'm, I'm in great shape and, uh, I'm not, not letting that slide at all. And, uh, just ready to go out and have some good time and, and be a character like I always was, you know, so have a good time. Yeah. So I'm ready. Anywhere else where people can find you besides your two uh, social medias, anywhere else to reach out and, uh, you know, try to book you. Okay. So my phone number is no, I'm just, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, now, mainly that's that's the two main ones. I'm also on TikTok, you know, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, if you want to just come find me, just hunt me down on Facebook and uh, hunt me down just like you did. And uh, in the or, or Instagram, one of those two. Uh, I'm not a big poster, which I should be. I should get more involved with uh, putting stuff online and stuff like that. But but uh, I'm, I'm going to try and get more into that. But uh, but yeah, that but you could I'll still find messages there and answer them. And, and uh, I'm happy to. I'm happy to to uh, to get back in that ring and put on a, a good a good show for people. All right, Tank, we got to have you back for part two. Barely scratched the surface here. We got to have you back on. But thank you hey. so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. Hey, John, I, I, pleasure's all mine. I'd love to come back anytime you want to have me.